Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our, our weekly Philip Philips Securities Research Morning Call. Today's agenda will have Microsoft Corporation Initiation, followed by BRC Asia, SETS, ESR REIT, and ARA Logos Trust, uh, Philip on the Grounds, and Court Life Group, uh, followed by Straits Times Index Technical Outlook and the Hansing Index Technical, uh, and ending with the Singapore Weekly Week 50. This will also be our final webinar for the year. But without further ado, we'll start off with Microsoft. Uh, we initiate our Microsoft with the title Winning the Global Enterprise on Cloud and Security. Uh, we see uh, glo global enterprises in the world upgrading their IT services with Microsoft. So just some background, Microsoft is the largest global productivity software product provider with 89% market share. So that's your Microsoft Outlook, uh, Word, PowerPoint, all these productivity softwares. Uh, they are the second largest global cloud computing company in the world with 20% market share. Cloud computing is uh, simply just renting computing power uh, to, to other people. So let's say if a business doesn't want to invest in their own uh, IT servers or their, or their own compute, uh, a lot of computers to process all their, all their data and their and their services, uh, they can actually rent the computing power from Microsoft, uh, from their, uh, the cloud business that Microsoft runs called Azure. So Microsoft has a 20% market share in the cloud computing uh, global markets. Microsoft is also the largest cybersecurity company in the world with 15% market share in a quite a fragmented uh, cybersecurity market. They have about more than 10 billion uh, of annual revenue are going to cybersecurity. So some segments that Microsoft report in, they report in the productivity and business processes, which is their Microsoft 365 applications. And, and uh, so then they have another segment called the Intelligent Cloud, which includes their Azure business. And lastly, their more personal computing, which is their Microsoft operating system, as well as their, the laptops that they sell, the Microsoft, uh, the Microsoft Surface Pro, uh, the Surface laptops, and also uh, the Xbox consoles that they sell. Uh, the main market for the Microsoft is the US with 50% revenue. So just some, uh, just some more context. Azure is used by 95% of the Fortune 500 companies, which is the largest companies uh, in the US. And uh, Microsoft software is used not only by 89% of companies, uh, of, of users globally, but also 85% used by the, uh, the US government entities. Uh, along with that, the Microsoft operating systems uh, for servers is used by 72% of servers in worldwide. So these are the, the computers that businesses use to store their data, to, to run all their application and their services for their own com company. And in order to run these computers and servers, they have to rely on an operating system. And most of them, 72% of them, rely on the Windows server operating system to run all their servers worldwide. So that's how entrenched Microsoft is with regards to uh, the, the IT services that they provide, not only to consumers, but to enterprises in the world. Our first investment thesis for Microsoft is their cloud adoption, Azure. Uh, is being driven by their vast enterprise and stock base. So Azure, the Microsoft Cloud business doubled its market share from 10 to 20% uh, from 2017 to 2021. And this expanding a lot due to the existing relationships that Microsoft has with global enterprises around the world. So used, Microsoft already has licenses for their, the server's operating system. 72% of servers worldwide use, use the Microsoft operating system. 83% of global personal computers are licensed with the Windows operating system. So it's, it's much easier. Uh, so many of the enterprises are choosing to go with Azure simply because they already are license holders with Microsoft. Uh, on top of that, Azure offers discounts to existing customers of Windows and SQL servers. Uh, so existing customers can pay up to five times less, uh, um, five times less than competitor Amazon Web Services. So if you look at the 
the table on the bottom left, I can see that the blue bar, the dark blue area, is how much uh, existing customers uh, want to move into the cloud, move, move their on-premise systems into the cloud. And that's how much they have to pay. Whereas if they choose to go with another provider, which is Amazon Web Services, uh, they pay up to they can, they can pay up to five times more. The reason is because uh, the, the two reasons are below. So the first reason is because if they go with another provider, they will have to repurchase uh, whatever SQ, SQL or Windows Server license that they already have with Microsoft. They, they have to repurchase it with the other cloud provider. So that adds to the cost. The second thing is that uh, if you move to Azure and you're already an existing customer, Microsoft provides you with free extended security updates for your existing server licenses. So up to three more years. So that's another point of savings that you get from moving to Azure. And so many, many customers are choosing Azure simply because of the discounts that they can get. Uh, the last point on why uh, some customers choose uh, Microsoft over uh, AWS also is because of the concerns that they have with regards to competition. Because AWS, Amazon Web Services, and also Google Cloud, Amazon Web Services is the largest cloud computing company in the world. And Google is the third, so Microsoft is the second. But uh, customers are choosing Azure uh, because uh, AWS and Google, Amazon and Google, they, are, they both sell ads and they both sell products on their platform. And so the concern is that they can actually become your competitors uh, if, if you choose to go into the cloud uh, with them. So you're actually working with your competitors. And that, that can become some concerns uh, to some of the customers. So Azure is Microsoft's fastest growing segment, 66% com compound annual growth rate for the past five years. And we, and we expect it to continue a strong growth of 41% next year. Uh, the second investment thesis is cybersecurity is driving uh, more demand for Microsoft's premium licenses. So Microsoft's highest end license is called the E5 license. And the user base for that license has uh, compared to the total user base of, from, of all their licenses increased from 5% to 8%. So there's a higher uh, proportion of uh, customers using the, higher, the highest end license uh, in FY21. Uh, the reason for the increase is because customers are upgrading for better security uh, in the highest end license after major cyber attacks in, the, in 2021. So if you look at the table on the bottom left, uh, these are the major cyber attacks that happened uh, this year. So, and on the right hand side is the ransom that the hackers asked uh, the companies for uh, after hacking them. So 18 million, 5 million, 11 million. And not only that, but and their operations were, were, were also affected uh, at, during the duration of the hack. So your, your whole company can be shut down in a matter of, in a very short time, uh, if you get hacked. So uh, this, is, uh, this is a reason why many of the enterprises are upgrading for highest cybersecurity in Microsoft. And Microsoft scale as, a, as the largest global security, cybersecurity company uh, with over 3,500 security, cybersecurity staff. They're seen as not only able to manage larger contracts, so for larger enterprises, but also be able to better respond to, faster respond to cyber attacks uh, versus if you have your own cybersecurity team of, of let's say three, 10 people. So Microsoft will be able to address the cyber attacks much faster. An executive order by the US government also drove uh, federal institutions to upgrade uh, their cybersecurity uh, postures. And many of them are choosing Microsoft because uh, about 85% are already using Microsoft's productivity software. So these license upgrades for Microsoft has helped to driven, helped to drive their average revenue per person up 7% in FY21, along with 19 year high operating margins of 40, 42%. So we expect these license upgrades to help to drive uh, commercial cloud revenues up 30% next year and help to sustain operating margins at above 40%. Uh, if you look at the chart in the bottom right, uh, you can see that the red line and the blue line, the red line is the margins, the blue line is the, the average revenue per person, per, 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 unit, uh, per user. So it's spiked up in FY21, uh, a lot of it driven by the cybersecurity concerns. 
And our last investment thesis is the core productivity software that still grows in double digits for Microsoft. So although they already have 89% of the, the productivity software market penetrated, the, the paid Office 365 commercial seats, which is basically the number of users that, that are licensed with uh, Microsoft, is still growing at double digits, 17% in FY21 to 300 million users. And the continued uh, economic recovery is expected to drive this, mainly due to driven demand from small and medium businesses. Uh, so an, another future growth for their productivity software is that they, uh, Microsoft announced maiden price increases that will kick in, in the, on the 1st of March next year. So up to 25% higher prices uh, for their li the, the commercial licenses that they, that, that they provide to, to enterprises. So this is the first time that they're raising prices and the prices increases are relatively higher for the lower end licenses. So if you, if you have a lower end license, uh, you'll probably be seeing a higher, a higher increase in the price, a uh, relative uh, increase to the prices that you're paying. So if you look at the table at the bottom right, uh, you can see that the basic, the basic uh, and the E1 licenses, which is the lower end licenses, the change is higher, 20%, 25% high, higher. Uh, whereas for the premium licenses like E3, E5, those, uh, the increases for those are lower. So we, we see that this could incentivize new customers to actually purchase uh, more higher end licenses. So this will be another tailwind for Microsoft's productivity software business. We expect the productivity business uh, to grow in 17% next year higher than the five-year historical average of 16%. So that's all for the investment thesis. Our target price valuation is 405 based on a WEC of 6.2% and a terminal growth rate of 4%. And uh, the upside is about 20, 20 plus percent. Uh, with that, I'll pass my time on to Terence. Thanks, Timothy, and good morning, everyone. We published our report on BRC Asia last week, and we provide a summary of their fourth quarter financial year 21 results. For fourth quarter financial year 121 earnings, they reported earnings of $10.2 million, which was 26.9% above our estimates. The beat came from, sorry, which formed 26.9% of our fourth quarter 21 estimates. The beat came from higher deliveries and the reversal of impairment loss from its associates. Gross profit margin also improved on a quarter on quarter basis as steel prices begin to ease. Provision for onerous contracts was lower and is also expected to reverse from financial year 22. So if you look at the table here on your left-hand side, uh, you, when you look at the revenue, you can see revenue was flat on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. We compared the financials on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis since uh, on a year-on-year -year basis is not very meaningful because of the COVID-19 pandemic last year. So the, the, the credit situation was also stable uh, despite the, the challenges faced in the industry. For BRC, their order book was also steady at $1.2 billion. When we look at the total contracts awarded in the construction sector for January to September 2021, uh, they reported contracts awarded for 20, of $21.7 billion. These already surpassed 2020's full year $21 billion. So for in nine months, they really surpassed uh, 2020. So for, for 2021, we do expect a, a bumper year for the, 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 the construction sector. In terms of the positives for BRC Asia, next slide. Thank you. F full year 21 profit exceeded our expectations by 24.2%. Uh, this was because of stronger order deliveries as the industry learned to adapt with COVID-19. So it, as compared to the past when COVID-19 would lead to, to uh, stop work orders and, and delays in, in the construction progress, the, the industry has learned how to adapt. So whenever there's a COVID-19 case, what they do is they just isolate the, the worker and they, they just continue work and they just do more testing. So in, in this way, it minimizes the disruptions to the, the construction schedule. And to reflect the, the group's confidence in their, their future, the group has declared uh, total dividends of 12 cents for the full year 2021. So this exceeds our forecast of 8 cents per share. So the, the 8 cents that they declare is on top of the 4 cents of interim dividend the company has already paid. And this 8 cents comprises of 4 cents of final and 4 cents of special dividend. The outlook for financial year 22 is also strong uh, with the BTO ramp up. 
So when we do a comparison, the BPO launches in 2019 was 14,600 flats. This compares with 16,800 in 2020 and 17,000 in 2021. So uh, you can see the, the uh, HDB has really ramped up the number of uh, BPO flats, which is positive for the, the, the construction sector. So consequently, we revise our FY22 profit upwards by 39%. But EPS is only up 12.5% as we factor in the higher share float and the higher order deliveries. In our next slide, we talk about the negatives. The net gearing inched up 1.17 times from 1.12 times as working capital needs increase due to higher inventory costs and sales. The total borrowings increased by another $40.9 million. The, the reason why their, their net gearing inched up on a quarter on quarter basis uh, because, is because the of the rising steel prices, which, which means that they need to, to acquire the new steel at a much higher price. So we, we do expect net gearing to remain elevated, but it should come down as they start to fulfill more of their contracts as well. In terms of outlook, the e easing border restrictions could aid further recovery in the construction sector. We believe the government will continue to ease border restrictions because, because when you look at the, the first half 21 foreign worker outflow, uh, 32,600 uh, workers actually uh, left the country. So th there's a, a, a huge shortage in the construction sector now. So we believe the government will look to continue to ease border restrictions while trying to minimize COVID-19 importation into the country. The, and we also expect the construction sector uh, recovery to continue into 2022. With that, we maintain our buy recommendation with a higher target price of $1.84 from $1.79 previously. Our valuations is based on 11 times financial year 22 PE, which is a 15% discount to its 10-year historical average PE on account of the uncertain environment. And so that's all for BRC Asia. Our next uh, Coverage is on sets limited, which is a Philip on the ground. We have think no, we have no coverage on sets. Uh, it, we, we met with sets last week uh, to give and, and give us a bit of update in terms of the, the group's future direction, a five-year plan, and also the new direction under their new CEO, Kerry Mock. So if you look at this chart here on the, the left hand side, uh, the glo global revenue per kilometer is expected to uh, reach pre-COVID levels by 2024. So if you if you look at this this chart here, the the pre-COVID, the, the, there's this yellow uh, section in this, this chart here. And this yellow section here actually reflects the range of uncertainty. So even though they expect uh, APEC travel to recover by 2024, you can see that a, 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 huge, a, a big amount of uncertainty still exists in terms of uh, globe, the, the global travel recovery. Air, tra air cargo though remains the bright spot exceeding pre-COVID levels. In terms of operating statistics, and when we talk about operating statistics, we look at flights handled and passengers handled. Uh, SETS is already beginning to see signs of improvement from November as the vaccinated travel lanes come into effect. Uh, they also guided that there should be no change in the company direction under the newly appointed CEO, Kerry Mock. Kerry Mock was previously the CEO of the SETS Food Solutions. So that he, he works very closely. He, as part of the core team, he worked very closely with the, 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 the previous CEO. So th there should be no uh, change in, their, in terms of their future direction. The next slide. In terms of their, their, their five-year targets, the, their, the, their FY25 targets, revenue, they expect revenue composition in FY25 to for 60% of the revenue composition to come from, from food. Uh, up from the from FY 54 percent and gateway services, which is previously the the a more stable uh, revenue source for them, to be at forty percent uh, in FY twenty five as compared to FY nineteen point six percent. Travel is expected to account for sixty five percent down sharply from FY nineteen eighty six percent. So SETS is making a very strategic and deliberate pivot towards uh, the non-travel uh, segment. This is to reduce their reliance on the, the travel segment, which in the last two years we can see has been a extremely volatile segment uh, and, and very susceptible to, to, to shutdowns. So non-travel will account for 35% of overall revenue up from FY19's 14%. So they intend to achieve this through the strengthening of food solutions, value chain presence, through channel expansion. So the meaning of this is that they go, they, they're going to, to retail through partnerships. So they will, they will uh, have restaurants, uh, tie-ups with some of the, the uh, different retail players in the market, and then, and then try to, to, to enter the, this space. 
and they will also look to continue to grow their cargo presence in different countries. The addressable e-commerce cross-border logistics market is US $4 billion. So if you look at the, the this chart here, this table here on your, your left-hand side, you can see the FY19's revenue is $1.8 billion. Uh, when they account for travel recovery, uh, investments in non-travel, and uh, also new investments, they will hit a target FY25 target revenue of $3 billion. Also do, do take note that this $3 billion uh, target revenue takes into account uh, some of the blue sky scenarios with regards to travel recovery. So that's all for Sets Limited. I'll now hand over the time to Natalie. Thank you, Terence, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll be talking about ESRE and ERA logos proposed merger. So just as a refresher, uh, for, one, for one unit of e -log, um shares, uh, the shareholder will get uh, 90, 90, 0 point, sorry, 95 cents um, consideration. 10% of it will be paid in cash, while the remaining 90% will be in, fulfilled in ESR stocks. So that means that um, well, for one unit of ALOC, you will get 1.68 or rather uh, 1.68 ESR units. Yeah. And the implied share uh, gross exchange ratio is about 1.86. Uh, times. So overall, this the main takeaway is that this uh, proposed merger is pro forma DPU accretive. Um, it will be 5.8% accretive for ESR REIT shareholders and 8.2% accretive for ARA Logos shareholders. In terms of the portfolio, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you can see what each of the existing REITs bring to the table. And that will, of course, lead to a combined portfolio of 87 um, assets, as well as 41 fund properties in Australia. Okay. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so the key merits for this acquisition, first of all, of course, would be the DPU accretion, as I earlier mentioned. And this DPU accretion for, for ESR um, REIT especially comes from two places. One of it is the lower cost of debt. It, it decreases from 3.24 to 2.84%, as well as due to this uh, upfront premium land, uh, payment of upfront land premium. Um, apart from that, because of the strong uh, sponsor, which is ESR uh, Cayman, they have a rough pipeline extended to this combined entity, valued at 50 billion US dollars, of which 2 billion is immediately executable. Uh, and because the sponsor is in several countries, uh, you can see in the graph on the uh, sorry in the, in the picture on the right hand side, they are in uh, China, India, Australia, and New Zealand, South Korea, Japan. So, uh, whereas these two ESRE and ERA logos, they are only they only have presence in Singapore and Australia. So, because of the of the strength of the sponsor and their their established footprints in various countries, this actually lowers new market entry risk for the combined entity. Post merger, sixty six percent of the portfolio will be in logistic and high spec assets. So these are new economy asset types. Um, and moving forward, of course, they hope to grow this proportion of their portfolio to about eighty percent. Um, there's also diversification and reduction in tenant concentration risk. Uh, and this larger scale allows them to undertake um, larger scale EEIs. Uh, at the, right at the bottom of the screen, there are three graphs. Um, basically, what they are showing is that um, ESR REIT uh, is the largest S REIT sponsor by AUM, the first graph, uh, two times larger than the next tier, which is Capital Land, um, as well as the, the kind of um, new economy assets that they have. Uh, it's more than 50 million US, US dollars worth of new economy assets. Uh, and the last graph actually shows the amount of assets under development, which will eventually form or join the pipeline for this combined entity in the future as they stabilize. Next slide, please. Okay, just to wrap things up, this is what we can expect the expected in the, in the indicative time, timeline. So uh, the EGM will happen sometime in early January. So this is when both uh, ARA logos as well as ESR shareholders will need to vote um, either in favour or against this proposed merger. That's the key date. Okay, that's all for me. I'll now hand the time over to Vivian for Court Life. Thanks, Natalie.
Um, so this will be a flip on the ground for the webinar that we hosted Court Live for, and we do not have coverage on Court Live. Firstly, um, Court Life is a leading provider of private court blood lining, court blood and lining banking services in markets including Singapore, Hong Kong, India, and also other markets. But these are the three main markets. So locally, Singapore contributes about forty percent to the total revenue, and Hong Kong and India contribute about thirty five percent. So the three main markets contribute about um seventy five percent in total. They have two main segments, firstly, which is the banking services, and this includes the storage of cord blood, lining, and tissue for 21 years from the, child, uh, from the birth of the child, which makes up around 95% um, of the total revenue. And the second segment is the diagnostics segment, under which they provide a variety of screening tests. The company is currently trading at about 15 times PE and they have zero debt, so the total cash is about $20 million. So what exactly is cord blood and lining? Firstly, cord blood is the blood from the umbilical cord um, left after childbirth and there are blood stem cells within the cord blood that could be used for stem cell transplants in the future. The differences between cord blood and lining, uh, you could refer to the picture on the top right. So there are different types of stem cells that could be found in these uh, three things. And for, for example, for cord blood, it's mainly MSC kind of stem cell. And for cord lining, you could, um, you could have other stem cells, including the epithelial stem cells. So this is also the reason for why the price point for storage of cord lining is slightly higher. Why do customers want to store it? So for court life, they will engage expectant mothers or women who are thinking of having children and educate them about the benefits of storing the court blood or lining. Other than being able to be used for own self, for example, for the child, um, which is autologous, it could be also used for family members, including parents, siblings, or even grandparents, which they call it allogenic purposes. So some clinical trials for stem cell treatment um, involve using them for autism treatment, which is being carried out by KK Hospital. And Cod Life is also working with the Philippines site to looking into using um, stem cell treatment for diabetic food ulcer, which they call it um, DFUs. The company is also venturing into other forms of banking services. So in March this year, they introduced this um, OptiQ, which is for storing coronal lenticules. And this could be used in the future for the patients who have uh, myopia or astigmatism conditions in um, their refractive eye surgeries to correct the eyesight. So that's um, it for banking services. Then the second one, which is diagnostic segment, basically it serves as an extension um, of the banking segment. So you could refer to the picture on the bottom right. And for, bank, uh, for diagnostic segment, it includes screening tests that could be carried out from the start of the pregnancy, including what they call the non-invasive prenatal testing, NIPT. And you also have um, genetic screening tests. You have um, genetic talent tests after the child is born and also vision tests uh, for screening the vision of maybe a six-month-old baby and um, etc. So the company is also ramping up on digital marketing channels through their mobile application, which is called Moms Up, and that serves as another platform for parenting resources on education to inform parents on the benefits of court banking. On the financials, 9 month 21 revenue and net profit were both down, uh, but for 3Q21, the revenue was up, mainly due to the lower number of new samples processed in first Q of FY21, as first Q of um, FY2020 was a higher base. Future plans or outlook, um, including firstly, increasing the penetration rates, which is low across both developed and developing countries. And this um, could be achieved through further education of expectant mothers or even uh, before they are expecting. And not only um, banking services, they are also looking into other kinds of testing services, basically to provide patients with services at various stages of life. So not only after the child is born, but maybe when the child um, grows up to three years old or six years old, then they could go back to court life for screening tests, including vision screening tests. Yep, so that's all for court life. Um, I will now be passing the time on to Weiren for technical analysis.
All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks, Vivian, for the call live. Um, so, um, for today's technical for the last of uh, 2021, I'll be doing a straight time index, Hang Seng index, and then Hang Seng tech index. So, uh, let's move on to the SDI. So, for the SDI, I think um, based on um, this year, you know, after last year strong rebound uh, from the COVID sell down, we can see that uh, there's a series of higher, high, higher low, and uh, if basically um, after that it broke off the down, uh, extended downtrend line since 2008. And you know, um, price continue to uh, the halted uh, for in terms of con uh, consolidation in early June this year. And uh, there was a pattern that I shared um, with uh, during my strategy Q uh, qu quarterly strategy that we did with the team. And of course, some some some, some sort of like uh, this kind of webinar. Um, it, yes, it did breaks off the pattern and then um, price briefly break through above the uh, 3002 um, psychological resistance. Um, however, I think that it did not last through a month. Uh, it, in fact, it was just only a few weeks and then uh, price quickly came down uh, and then um, uh, in November last month and then corrected itself, um, touches uh, support zone one and then rebounded. All right, but uh, I feel that you know, based on the momentum, uh, we are likely to see expected range bound scenario beyond the uh, beyond quarter one, first quarter of 2022. All right. Um, price likely is going to range bound between three thousand to three thousand two hundred and sixty region. Um, thereafter, um, if everything goes well during this consolidative period, um, no adverse uh, macroeconomics uh, factor, I think that um, SDI price will likely to break three thousand three and then target three thousand four during the end of twenty twenty two Q four. All right. Um. Uh. That which is a one six one point eight percent of the of the first set of higher high high low from March twenty twenty to December twenty twenty. Um. Fibonacci expansion level. All right. Um. So um. The next slide I'll show on the daily chart of the SDI. So for the daily chart of the SDI, you can see that um. Uh, at the support zone, there was a rebound. Uh, Stochastics shows a very uh, strong crossover, um, oversold crossover. Uh, but however, I think that um, despite it forming a harami pattern uh, as support zone one, uh, the outbreak of the of the in the strong uh, bearish candle in last week of uh, November um, wasn't that strong. You can see that um, that the recent candles has already rejected the. Kijun Sen and then the Tenkan Sen as well. Um, prices, um, price of, um, the, the point level of SDI is still well within the Kumo. So likely we are thinking of a range bound scenario after that. Um, so immediate trend right now, um, as I, I seen, um, uh, the SDI has uh, gap up this morning and then um, quickly is, is quickly attempting to fill up a gap and then signify a common opening gap uh, that we are seeing. Um, furthermore, I think that uh, there will be some sort of like uh, further consolidation within a consolidation. So um, prices likely to revisit 3088 uh, region before uh, uh, another form of like uh, consolid consolidative rebound to the upside again. All right, so uh, with that, I end off my SDI. So um, the next slide will be the Hang Seng Index. Uh, the Hang Seng Index, I'll, I decided to do a weekly chart, uh, shows uh, the, the movement from 2016 to current present day. So you can see from 2016 onwards all the way to, 2007, uh, to, uh, early, to early 2018, you can see that there is a five wave move of the intermediate phase. Uh, and then uh, it is likely it, it actually went into a correct, corrective ray uh, downside trend uh, with a triple zigzag uh, movement. Okay, so uh, tentatively, I think the wave zag is uh, much more like uh, a confirmation case. Uh, first of all, we can see that the momentum divergence is same uh, right at the support zone at 22864 to 23592 uh, region. And then secondly, I think um, for the Hang Seng, uh, Hang Seng Index, uh, there's uh, some sort of bullish uh, engulfing candle. Um, as long as it does not breach below 22864, I think that uh, the potential upside is still ongoing uh, furthermore. All right, um, but the key thing to take note that is that um, 2006 and 26,000 to 26,450 um, level need to be broken. Uh, if not, uh, we won't consider the Hang Seng Index uh, returning to the upside again. Uh, should 26,000 uh, fails to clear, 
I think the next level we are looking for a, a temporary rebound will be 31,000 to 22,000 uh, region um, being seen uh, over there. So it means like it's like a false breakout, uh, something. So for next and then my last chart of the year will be uh, the Hang Seng Tech Index. So the reason why I share Hang Seng Tech is that I think is uh, very much to do with the macroeconomic um, events in China itself. I think the clamping down of the tech is still, uh, the fear of clamping down is still very looming. Um, but uh, with that, I think uh, Hang Seng Tech Index, despite breaking out of the downtrend line, all right, uh, Hang Seng Tech Index has not seen a very clear higher high and high low. So there isn't any uptrend for now. So we can conclude that right now, Hang Seng Tech Index is going through a momentary range bound uh, scenario. Okay, first of all, um, let's let's bring up to the present day. You can see that there's a there's a smaller uh, V shape uh, rebound um, below five thousand five uh, five thousand seven hundred. So um, um, there, if you go down lower time frame, there is a uh, there is an inverted head and shoulder. So uh, we are expecting price to break resistance of six one seven nine point three nine, and then target above uh, six thousand seven hundred eighty. Um, level target resistance level all right um likely uh hang seng tech index range bound scenario is going to go along uh for for two more quarters uh before there's uh, evidently a, a rebound to the upside again okay so with that um i end off my presentation i pass my time paul for the singapore weekly paul to you thank you okay i think thanks Baron. so just move on to some of the key macro highlights that were released last week uh, in terms of the property, this, this doesn't come from URA, this comes from Realist, which we subscribe. So uh, the numbers may not be exactly the same when URA releases the results, but uh, I think uh, Realist is more when you sign the SPA. I, I think URA is more from uh, what they get from the developers. But nevertheless, uh, the numbers that we see is that the new, new home sales continue, continues to be uh, very strong. Uh, it, it was about 1,400 units compared to maybe 900 the month ago. And year on year compared to last year, it's almost doubled. So new home sales is still very strong. Uh, in terms of resale units, it's about 1,002. Uh, it's down year on year, but again, 1,002 is still a very, very strong number because the year ago was about 1,005. The, anyway, in conclusion, uh, new home sales and resale continue to be uh, very vibrant in Singapore, at least for the November numbers. And this should, again, still post well for the real estate, uh, for the developers and also for the real estate agents uh, in terms of the other data point was construction awarded uh, the numbers is very volatile uh, this comes from bca that means the amount of contracts awarded by the public and private sector so it came about 2.4 billion which is much better than than last year's 1.6 billion but slightly off from 2.7 but we'll show you a chart later that the recovery is still underway and we yet to peak in terms of uh, construction contracts awarded. Uh, there was also some news on the uh, MES financial stability review. Uh, there was some news that you know, maybe household debt in Singapore, I mean, came from the media that was too high. Then maybe just double check the number. It doesn't seem so. I think household debt is 70%. It's uh, higher than the pre pandemic, but it's just slightly off the all time low of uh, 66%. And we are far, far lower than a lot of Asian countries. We'll show you a chart later. In terms of the US, I think we, we all heard the news. There was the CPI numbers, which is highest in 30 plus years. And also the headline was 7%. So inflation in the US is running about 7. And it's about the, almost a 40-year high. Now some of the components, I mean, I was so curious what were the components that were rising the most. A lot of it is uh, vehicles, so used cars, new vehicles. Again, all this uh, pandemic related, the shortages in semiconductor, especially. Uh, services actually didn't move when you look at airline fares. Uh, the other big number that came up from the US was the jobless claims. So, this is the amount of unemployed people you know, looking for unemployment benefits. So, this is a weekly number, so it can be a bit volatile, but regardless, the number that came up for the week of 4th December uh, this is 184,000. So, this is the lowest. It's like, since I don't know, more than 50 years. So just another indicator that the US economy remains strong, especially on the, for labor. Uh, we have a Philip talk on the, uh, on the ground. Uh, there, was, there was a question on why is Philip on the ground? Philip on the ground is, is just basically our commentary for stocks that we, we just, it's not rated or just basically those that our analysts have access to meetings, group meetings at least. 
which not a lot of attendees, not a lot of uh, retail investors may not have access. So that's why we, we just do this on the ground just to share with all the list, all the attendees some of the key points of the meeting, hopefully the key points and hopefully you can just help those that, that may not be, have get access to such meetings or were not available to for such meetings. Uh, in terms of our tactical view, uh, even the CPI read was so high and almost a uh, uh, 40 year high, uh, the bond markets didn't react. Actually, the bond markets was, I think, flat or slightly off. So it means that the, the market already pricing in a lot of this inflation. So we think one possible scenario is not, not, not so near, but maybe in six months' time, when we hope, see inflation maybe tapering off, uh, it could actually be another a driver for the equity market. So again, this is uh, maybe this is a couple more months away. Uh, I think this one we know uh, this is all kinds of news on Omicron. Uh, but again, this is the UK, sorry, not the US, the UK HSA just gave some commentary. Uh, in terms of the key event, I think the key event is everyone's watching for would be the FOMC meeting. Uh, and then uh, and it will be probably dis be discussing how much more, how fast they want to, to do this tapering or stop buying any more uh, government bonds and mortgage bonds. Uh, in terms of events, uh, there's uh, again, this the, there will be no more events for the rest of this year. I mean, just only two weeks, but uh, next year, I think, 13 January, we will have hyphens and 15 is our usual Singapore strategy on Saturday and this TOTM technologies, which I'm not sure what company is, but any, this is another event that we'll be hosting for all attendees. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of the uh, pandemic, again, just do a quick update. Uh, you can see the blue line, this global cases is, it continues to rise. I think the good news, if there's any, is that the mortality rates is stable. I think the last time we had such a high number, you can see from the red line, the mortality rates is much, much higher. Uh, what's driving the increase is, is, as mentioned before, is Europe. I mean, this is just for info purpose. Uh, next slide. Uh, in, in Singapore, the cases, uh, the good news is that, that cases are coming down and we don't see any major spike since the 22nd November easing, the dining restriction easing, as which we all know of. And, uh, so there's a possibility that end, end December, they could pare down the restrictions. Uh, again, expectations is that end December, they could make another round of easing. Uh, next slide. Uh, the, since this is the last time for the year, we just wanted to keep uh, update on the mo mobility. So this is Google. As you all know, Google is tracking all of us. So this is just to track the movement of, of, uh, of, of those Google users in Singapore. Uh, you can see from the blue line, uh, the main one is the blue line. You can see that the retail activity has returned. I think retail is probably the, the blue line. is probably the highest level uh, uh, since the pandemic occurred. Of course, zero is pre-pandemic, so you can, can uh, you can see that it's probably ten percent off the highs. Uh, I mean, the the ten percent off pre-pandemic levels. Uh, again, this is a bit. There's a bit of seasonality since we're entering the festive period, but it is probably good for retail malls so that just the 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 uh, activity is returning to the malls. I mean, based on this, uh, what is not returning is transit. So this is people, uh, uh, no, uh, people, the public sitting on rail, sitting on buses. So this is not happening. I think it's still. Uh, but you can from this you can it's probably like almost thirty percent below pre-pandemic levels. Uh, likewise for the yellow line, this is people. Uh, these are the people going to offices. Again, this is probably like twenty percent. I mean, you all know everyone's working from from home. So again, this is quite a good in, interesting indicator because you can track the movement of everyone, which is a bit scary too. But anyway, uh, let's move uh, next line. Uh, it, okay, this chart on the left is just the construction activity. Uh, the main one is the blue line. So the blue line just shows the amount of contracts awarded. Uh, the red line is, of uh, course, you can award, but are you, uh, is there any work done? So the red line is basically the work done, you can say, and the blue line. So for us, uh, when we look at this chart, you can see in 2019, the high was probably 35 billion a year in terms of construction work awarded. And right now, we are still in the midst of recovering. So we think, I think that's why we, we have, a, I believe, buy calls on PenU and also BLC because we think it's still an early stage for the construction recovery. Uh, as you can see, the blue line still has a lot more to recover. Uh, the one on the right is just household debt, which uh, just for reference. So uh, Singapore is the red line. So I wouldn't call this an alarming line, which maybe the media kind of highlighted. You can see the highs was probably about nine, uh, in 2000, 2003, where uh, household debt. Household debt is more like mortgages, credit card, and, and so forth. Of course, mini mortgages. Uh, yeah. 
so so you can see compared to other countries like Australia, Korea, and Hong Kong, uh, we are far far lower. And even the recap, the rebound we had, is still, uh, you know, it's 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 just uh, modestly off the all time lows. I guess about sixty plus percent. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of the, uh, just a quick flash check on what is are there. Uh, okay, sorry, the, the the table on the left is just the CPI. Just to give you an illustration, how how high uh, in, in inflation has spiked up in the US, the red line. And you can see the last time it was so high was 1982. And during that time, actually, interest rates was as high as, I don't know, 10% or maybe 12%, uh, the, which is the blue line. You know, right now, it's probably 1.5, 1.6. Uh, the one on the right is just uh, a bit of a difficult chart to understand, but the blue bar just is the number of hikes. The uh, Each hike is about 25 basis points. So the expectations is almost three rate hikes for 2022. So the market is really pricing in that the Federal Reserve will start moving even as early as June. And in terms of what they expect by end December, uh, how you read this chart is by end December, what is the Fed funds rate that the market is expecting, the futures market is? Uh, it's about 0.75. Yeah. The reason why it's not three rate hikes, which is 25, 25, because right now the Fed funds rate is, I think, 0.08 or something. Yeah. I mean, next slide. Okay, this is just our update. We, there was a briefing for analysts on top glove. Uh, uh, I'll just give you some key highlights. The table, uh, the pictures on the right is just the year-on-year -year performance. So revenue was down 70, profit was down 90% uh, year-on-year. Uh, but again, this is compared to exceptionally high period. Uh, I mean, exceptionally good year last year. Uh, in, in terms of the, the ASPs, so ASPs was down 32% quarter on quarter, and uh, most of it was nitrile gloves, which is the synthetic rubber gloves. Uh, in terms of the utilization, uh, you, you can see from here the their utilization now is about 60%. Pre pandemic is 80 So it basically means that there's still a lot, of, a bit of overcapacity. That means uh, the supply has responded to well. There's too much capacity right now at, in the in the time being. That's why their utilization is only sixty. Uh, in terms of the outlook, so they're going to defer some of the expansion plans. Uh, for those who not not do not know, no Malaysia is going to uh, uh impose a prosperity tax for any company, which is uh, a mix more than hundred million. Uh, commentary from them is that they got many subsidiaries. So if you make ninety nine point nine nine, you won't get tax. Uh, of course the tax authority is not so silly, but, but in general, they got many subsidiaries, so not everyone can cross the 100 million, so they may not get the full hit on the prosperity tax. Uh, and in terms of the oversupply situation, just to give a bit of color, they said that uh, Malaysia used to maybe have 50 factories, but the last one, one two years, they added almost 30 new factories. Uh, the EBITDA is... Uh, is 16% last, last time, now it's 22 So you're beginning to find some grounding on some normalized level of, of margin. So the ASPs may, may still declare a little bit, but you're more or less kind of hitting the bot, the trough levels, I guess, if you use this EBITDA margin. Uh, they're still planning for a dual listing in Hong Kong, uh, which is in early 22. Uh, I, I think the rest, uh, I won't go through because it's just self explanatory I think developing markets is the main growth driver. I mean, not stating the obvious. Okay, uh, I think that's it for us. Uh, I think we can go to questions. Thanks. Uh, I think I will start the first questions uh, for the technicals. I uh, think I saw a few um, questions on that. So I'll answer uh, the first one on straight trading. So for straight trading, I think uh, I should report before when uh, prices were still around here, but unfortunately it didn't really clear above the resistance of $3.55. Uh, subsequent correction um, uh, was found uh, supporting near $3.31 to $3.35 uh, support zone. Um, Ichimoku is still showing a downside trend uh, with a Senko span A sloping down uh, with a threat of uh, crossing below. All right, uh, but uh, as price going to range, I think I think the best case scenario right now is uh, straight trading is going to a range bound scenario, uh, as shown from the um, um, the directional movement index. Uh, it has crosses. Uh, the ADX is trending down, uh, with the DM plus and minus um, going through a very strong very strong uh, tightening process. So at most, uh, I say that currently is round right now ranging. 
Okay, so for the Yang Zijiang uh, shipbuilding, uh, Yang Zijiang, I still maintain my buy limit, uh, buy limit region at one dollar eight cents to one dollar and fourteen cents. Okay, so uh, this is what I have in mind. Uh, reason is because I think the the test that the, after a bearish gap down, all right, uh, prices still um still stays within here. Although there's a bullish uh, bullish rebound above, uh, we believe that uh price is likely to be kept at one dollar forty cents before a sell down, uh, coming again. Uh, Ichimoku shows some some sort of light uh at the end of the tunnel, uh, but prices still remain below the Kumo. So um. I would say at most is still ranging. Uh, this do display like a very the eight directional movement index do display like what um I showed previously on the straight trading. So uh, range bound do indeed uh have is happening right now. Uh, at most right now I think that I I would think of a bearish a bearish flag, uh one forty and then uh just uh, uh, coming down uh, again. All right. So for nano firm, um I I mentioned this uh I think quite a last month webinar during the November period. Uh, it's still on the downtrend. Um, prices did, did go up, uh, perform expected. I thought that five, four dollar and 24, 25 cents will be will be rejected, but uh, it goes up to four dollar and 30 cents uh, before a uh, correction. Um, lack of volume, volatility uh, expected, is expected to drive prices down. Um, I think Mm, I think much prime pressure will appear at three dollars seventeen to three dollars thirty one cents uh, movement. Okay, um, but do take note that there is a potential head and shoulder as well. Um, should this uh, sloping neckline down, uh, neckline resistance being broken. Okay, so uh, just for for now, firm there is two two sets. Um, even if it breaks above the neckline resistance, um, five dollar will be a very strong resistance uh, turn support region. Um, so yeah. Uh, for manual life US read, um, wait, let me see, is it manual life? Yeah, manual life. Uh, manual life has been ranging for very much, uh, for very long. Um, uh, and then Ichimoku is showing a, a, a three bearish death cross. Uh, so if price is going to break 0 0.645, um, I think I expect uh, 585 to 565 to be the next uh, rebound region to the upside. Uh, looking at the ADX, um, the DM minus is above the ADX means that the downside, the, the downtrend is much stronger than the, the average. So I'll, I'll believe that downtrend is still go going to range uh, uh, room a little bit longer. Um, for the Lion uh, HS, uh, the Hang Seng Tech Index, um, just now I've shared about the Hang Seng Tech Index, um, there's a V-shaped rebound. Um, so the Hang, Seng, the Hang Seng Tech Index on the index itself is much more vis visible. Uh, uh, there's a smaller head and shoulder kind of formation on the lower time frame. Um, but uh, on, on, the, on the HSD, on the SGX itself, uh, I think the upside need to really clear $1.8. $1.08 to, to confirm the upside. Um, like I say, mentioned about Hang Seng Tech Index, um, prices is likely to range uh, much more further. Uh, and there won't be visible, clear signs of trending momentum uh, for Hang Seng Tech Index. Uh, move on, moving on to the banks. Uh, the banks, um, uh, price has really broken up, uh, quite kind, kind of well supported at three thirty dollars and forty four, thirty dollars and ninety three cents. Uh, but prices, you still remember the gap over here, um, is still rejecting it. So, uh, we expect one more round of uh, downturn, uh, going on, uh, before going on to the upside again. Uh, for UOB, UOB has the uh, as um has broken out of the is was one of the well performing um banks for for the uh for the uh for the in, in terms of technicals uh but it didn't really sustain above 28 dollars in fact uh, tested once uh, twice the second time it opens it, it, it just formed a dark cloud cover and the rest was history um the upside do resemble what um i showed during the sti earlier on um, but you know, uh, prices uh, decide to come down uh, gap with a bearish candle uh, within the Kumo itself. So uh, for UOB, it's much more like a, like a, a range bound scenario. So uh, if there's extended move, I think $23 and $24 and $24 uh, can be a very good trend to look for. Uh, otherwise, um, can look out for this near term support at $25.95.
Uh, for CBC, it's much more of a not really a stronger uh, strong move out of the three banks. I, I was initially uh, based on technical was uh, OCBC, uh, but after that, you know, OCBC does the fall was much greater. The technical fall was much greater than the two other banks. Um, so for OCBC, you can see that uh, prices is uh, has similar. Um, trajectory as UOB, DBS, and the SDI index, um, but um, price um, price do rebound from the key support at $11 to $11.23, but um, the Irish candle is how push price down. So um, do look out for $10.59 to $10.73 support zone um, going forward, okay? Um, there's someone asking about um, Thai Bev. Thai Bev rebounded uh, successfully at my support zone at 635 to 650. Um, despite a, a, a end wave curve. So I believe that midterm price is going likely to revert back to uh, 71 to 715 cents uh, resistance zone over here. So it's some sort will be like a movement for this level. Yeah, so that's for Thai Bev. Uh, some power, some power is uh, having a double bottom uh, with a falling wedge in between. Uh, divergence can be seen, but ADX is not showing a very good uh, signal. So means that uh, price is not trending. Uh, furthermore, you can see that there is a bearish harami pattern. So uh, the only way to track the, the bearish harami is to clear 505 and then 530 resistance zone. Um, and then it breaks up on the upside uh, again. So that's the, the thing it, uh, it's about. Uh, lastly, I think, um, uh, capital Corp, Capital Corp, uh, I, I failed at the report again. So uh, price uh, has a three wave down back to the to the support zone, uh, but the, the upside movement remain sluggish. Uh, there is a bearish uh, dark cloud cover potentially uh, crossing below the Kijun Sen and, the and rejecting the resistance, key resistance at 530. Uh, this was a key resistance because this was a previous support that, that, that was, that was uh, on the upside. But unfortunately, I think price is going to go down lower. Um, I think uh, looking at that, we are looking at 5493 to 485. And then subsequently, if this region is broken, we will be looking at 461 to 474. Uh, four dollars seventy four and four dollars sixty one. Okay. Um. I think that's all for me. Wait. Uh. Let me see. Um. There's one more. I will. I will. I'll do one last one before I pass my time. So I'll do bar. Um. I'll do nine nine eight eight. I'll do Alibaba. So Alibaba. Uh. Dow trend still remains. So. Uh, I, I won't recommend uh, doing uh, concentrating on Alibaba. I will say that um, looking at JD and Meituan uh, will be a much um, um, a much better play. Uh, Meituan, as you can see, um, the three end wave. Uh, I think there's some sort of much uh, better play in state uh, going forward. And then for Meituan and uh, JD nine nine six one eight. So JD has uh, completed its uh, upside and then uh, if price do uh, retreat back to 271 to 279, there is a the potential of going back to the upside for JD.com. All right, um, lastly will be Ping An. Ping An, I, um, if I'm not wrong, okay, um, Ping An. Ping. So for Ping An, uh, prices remain very much of range bound. Okay, I'm going to close off. Um, price is, it needs to cross above $62 um, to confirm the upside. Otherwise, I think that uh, prices is going to uh, range for the moment. Um, likely, it's going to form like kind of like a, a symmetrical triangle. So uh, be patient, wake up, wait for a symmetrical triangle to form and then uh, buy on a rebound. That will be a least uh, risky buy for Ping An. All right, so uh, that's all for me. And then I'll pass my time to Paul and my rest of colleague to answer the rest of the question. Thank you. Yeah, can, can I, um, Terence, you want to take some? Yeah, sure, Paul. Yeah, I think I think the question, the, the higher rank questions first. So there's one question on BRC. Why why invest in BRC Asia with razor thin gross margins of seven point four percent, even if the margin 
oh, sorry, I lost a point. Even, even if the margin triple, it is still very thin. Yeah, Melvin, so that's a, very, very, that's a, that's a valid question. The, the, for BRC Asia, even historically, when, when, the, when the, in, a, in a normalized environment, their gross margin range about 10 to 12 percent. So good, their gross margins has always been very, has always been very thin. Uh, and the reason for that is because of the nature of the products they produce. Uh, they, they primarily produce rebars. They are a, a essential component uh, for in the, in the construction industry. So the, their, their value add is really the, 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 the molding of the rebars and then, then selling it to the, the, the construction players. So the, 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 their, their margins consequently is very thin. But for BRC Asia, the, 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 the investment thesis is not their margins. The investment thesis is that even in, in down years, uh, when, when the construction industry was very challenging last year, they still managed to report a profit. So last year, they did about $30 million profit, even with the, the pandemic causing uh, shutdowns in the, the construction industry and, and hots uh, in, the, in the construction industry. And the, the, the main thesis for BRC Asia is because they are a market leader in the construction industry. In the, the rebar segment, they hold about 65 to 70% market share, which means that when construction industry, when, the, when you see the construction industry growing or, or see a recovery in that, they, they, they take the, the, the lion's share uh, of, of, of the, the, the construction industry because, the, the, because of the, the, their, their dominant market position uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the industry. And, and they, and, and they also they also uh, reward shareholders as well. Uh, at, at the when at our last report, uh, when we when we publish our last report, when we hike the target price, uh, they are, they, they are trading about seven point nine percent, uh, dividend yield. So so that that we think give give investors some comfort in terms of, uh, the way they they kept they return their capital to to shareholders and also, uh, and also the uh reflect their confidence like the outlook for. For, for the future. The, uh, one last investment thesis we, 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 we feel for BRC Asia is that their market leading position also gives them the ability to choose the type of customers that they, they want. So uh, when, when you're the market leader, you, you tend to be able to go for, choose your customers that are slightly better in terms of credit, being more credit worthy. Uh, so even, even though you see the, the, the construction outlook being a little bit more challenging, they are able to uh, also keep their, their receivables in payment to, to the minimum. In fact, from our presentation, their receivables in payment uh, was below uh, what, what we thought it would, uh, they would report. Yeah, so let me know if I answer your question. Uh, if not, you can just follow up with another question. I'll go to the next one. What is your BRC Asia's previous target price? Our previous target price was $1.79. Uh, we, we hiked it up uh, to 184, also still based on the same uh, 11 times PE metric. Uh, even though we revised our profit upwards by uh, nearly about 39%, but the, the, the EPS was slightly lower because of the expanded uh, share flow that they did in, in uh, uh, a few months back. Yeah, I, I think I just, let me just scroll down and see if there's any more questions. Uh, I, I, think, I think I see one question for Paul, but may, maybe I, I'll just try to, to take this also. Uh, uh, hi, Paul. Is the TP of 44 cents for Pen U, as mentioned in Jayquay's report on 6 August, still valid? Yeah. So, so yes, the, since the, the publication of the report on the 6th of August for the first half uh, 21 results there, there hasn't been any more. Uh, they, 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 didn't, they, do, they didn't do a quarterly update because they don't, they don't need to. So, the, they, there have been no update to the target price. But when they release their full year 21 results, we will, we will put, put out an uh, 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 updated report. Yeah, I think that's all for me. I'll hand back the time to the rest of my colleagues. Okay. Um, okay. L let me just try to answer some of the questions. Uh, may I know, uh, while uh, Comfort Delgro has not yet been removed in the index, will it cause the risk that its share price will fall further until it is removed? May I know what is the next support for Comfort Delgro? Uh, I think that, that support will probably be for Weiren. Uh, but uh, in terms of the index, we think uh, next in line should be Olam. Although the market cap is higher, 
uh, if you look at the, the straight times component index, uh, the, the, the smallest is actually dairy farm. Uh, so Comfort is probably ranked, I think, uh, one, two, I, I think 20, 24th out of the 30. So below this dairy farm, Samcom Industries, Jardin Circle and Carry Sets and Yang Chichang. Again, my, my only guess is that if they want to take down, take out Comfort, with Olam, it should be those at the below uh, Comfort because it's not just the market cap, it's the float. So, so Comfort Dagger is quite a large float. In, uh, so that's why they're not at the bottom. The bottom is really Dairy Farm. And after, before Dairy Farm, Samco Industries. Again, my own guess, if, if, it's, if, uh, if they were to remove, then these would be the ones that could be at risk uh, rather than Comfort. Uh, again, this is just my own guess because unless Comfort is the, the bottom. So this is based on the 10th of December uh, yeah, I hope that that, that helps. Uh, uh, the next one is Hypo. Do you have any comments on the current weakness on the share price? Yeah, I man, this is the most the biggest mystery of all. <laughs> this is like the big mystery. Even I was speaking to someone who's a shareholder, also they also can't understand <laughs> why. I really don't really. Fundamentally, there isn't anything. Uh, they probably can hit seventy or eighty million. So the market cap is probably. 10 times PE, their net cash is, is uh, 200 million out of the 700. So five, probably like eight times PE or six, seven times PE, excluding cash. So, sorry, yeah, seven, eight times PE. So uh, I don't see anything, I didn't hear of any, anything weak. Yeah. So a lot of those who took the IPO, are, a lot of clients that took the IPO are all complaining. Yeah, sorry, I don't have any insight or answers for them. Yeah, I can only give you all the complaints that I hear. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Sorry, sorry, not very helpful, Benny. Anyway. Um, okay. Um, let me answer this before I hand it over to to um before I ha hand it over to uh to Natalie. Uh, Good afternoon, Paul and team. Uh, asking about the coming spec IPO. Are the shares that we managed to apply at IPO redeemable before a merge? Uh, yeah. Uh, just for your info, okay. Uh, let, let me just do a quick share screen. Uh, so, sorry, Baron, if I can share screen. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just try and quickly share. Uh, again, this is all new for us too. I mean, we've not really done, but this is from SGX. So on the day of the listing, uh, it's not even called shares, it's called units, okay? Because it's a, then after 45 days, they will detach the shares and units. Mandatory detachment. So your deadline to vote is, is here. Uh, the one I'm not very sure, which I should go and check, but I'm not very sure is whether if you did if you redeem, can you still vote for this EGM? I'm not not very sure of, of that. That one is I, I myself not clear, but you can your deadline for redemption is here. Uh the 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 other thing is that thing, I think the, the question was also the pricing is 100 units and the price is five dollars. I think that's probably the most likely price. Yeah. I I, I yeah, sorry, William, I took back uh, hand it back the screen to you. Yeah. Um, then secondly, if you buy further shares on the spec from the secondary market, are these shares redeemable too? When you wish to, uh, when shareholders wish to redeem. Oh yes, yes, yes. The redemption is for everyone, and the redemption can only happen, uh, is if the merger, uh, uh, if the merger is suspect successful, the demerger. So I think you can also vote for it. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so a bit confusing on the redemption, but you can you can uh, you can redeem regardless if you are uh, if you buy it at IPO stage or you buy it in the secondary market. I think the best to buy is when it's still in the units so before they start to detach, right? Forty five days because at least if you buy the units, you still get the warrant. Yeah, because the detachment is only on the thirtieth, so I think you should be still entitled to the warrants if you buy, uh, forty five days before. It, it detaches, so that means it breaks up to shares. And, and yeah, it's a bit very confusing. Anyway. Yeah, thirdly, what would be the probable share price of the coming IPO and what would be the minimum lot size to apply? Yeah, uh, I think the minimum is 100 uh, according to SGX and the share price is $5. That is slightly going to be the price for, for Singapore. I mean, US is $10. Yeah, I, I hope that that answers. Until we get the first spec, I mean, this is as much as I can share. Yeah, th th thanks for that. Uh, I hand it over to Timothy and, and Natalie. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, the question for me would be, uh, Microsoft is the current share price value 
to buy in. I think trying to say, trying to ask whether can can you actually buy now, right? And what the second part is, what is the risk of its near term performance? Okay. Uh, with regards to the current share price, I I'll leave that to Wayren if he can answer that. Uh, but the current share price is three four two point five, and our target price is four hundred and five. So that's about a twenty percent upside. Uh, the risk to near term performance, uh, fundament fundamentally, uh, this investment right in Microsoft, it would be more on the cloud business. So because, uh, Microsoft is the second largest cloud business in the world, and the two competitors is Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud. So two two of these uh, competitors. First of all, Amazon has a head start. It is is much bigger than Microsoft, and they have a seven year head start. So their their services that they the services that they provide on AWS can be more extensive than than Azure. And Google recently has also been uh putting up some challenge to to uh to Microsoft. Uh, that that's what that's what uh Microsoft uh, partner salespeople have been saying uh, The Google has been challenging a lot of their sales. Uh, but to help to mitigate this, Microsoft has, is slowly uh, releasing, intru uh, introducing new solutions for their cloud business. So right now, they recently introduced a specific industry solutions for the cloud to financial services, manufacturing, and non-profits. And they also have the most, uh, their, the most regions that the cloud can reach. So they have 73 regions compared to AWS only 24 regions. So these two things will help. Uh, we believe will help Microsoft still take market share uh, with regards to the cloud. So the market share doubled in the, in the past three years. And I, we think that uh, it, there's still room to continue. Uh, another risk would be the supply chain issue because uh, Microsoft, they do do hardware which is the, surf the Surface laptop that they sell, and also Xbox. So currently, they, they are still, the recent update is that they, they have not been able to, to uh, fulfill demand for these two, for the hardware devices. So the, the risk is that the supply uh, shortage may come in worse than expected. Although uh, we're already seeing that it's, it's, it's been recovering, it's been easing uh, recently. Uh, so Microsoft, Despite this, Microsoft has kept a quite a strong forecast for their uh, more personal computing segment, which includes all these devices. So they still keep their very strong forecast. So that is quite comforting with regards to that risk. So these will be the two risks that we are looking at for Microsoft as an investment. Okay. Uh, I think that's all for me. Uh, I'll pass, my, pass the time to Natalie. Uh, thank you, Timothy. Okay, so for uh, I, I see two questions for me. Uh, first of all, can you give an update on uh, Dasin Retail Trust? So for Dasin, they actually skipped their uh, third quarter uh, business update. Um, so the as um the most recent um update on the operations uh was the operation was the update on the first half of twenty twenty one. So from what we understand, um the China the China retail market has been improved proving uh, in fact it was uh, recovering even faster than you know a lot of the major economies worldwide um, the main overhang once again is the is the refinancing of their loans so a bulk, bulk of them will actually be expiring um, in December or uh, 18 December to be specific so um, of course we, we hope that they will be able to refinance it the ramifications if they do not Manage to secure this line of financing, um, is that you know their assets might be forced sold by the bank because uh, their loans are actually extended on secured basis. So mean you say that it it is the bank that has the claim on the on the asset and not the the manager. So the manager, even if they want to sell the asset, they can't because it has been pledged to the bank. Uh, another update is that um, you know after the after the Sino Ocean actually acquired. Uh, managed to acquire seventy percent stake in the trustee manager. The chairman um uh, stepped down, uh, and also of course because of this, the idea was for the the chairman to actually sell some of his um shares in the trust 
to this new um, partner, which is Sino Ocean. Uh, and Sino Ocean is uh, invested ha has invest two very strong investors. Um, I think they are they are uh, as a government linked organizations um, in China. Yeah. So the idea is that hopefully with this uh, more important or uh, rather you know financially strong sponsor. Um, it will help with their future refinancing negotiations. And, you know, if need be, there can actually be some shareholder loans. Yeah, so this is just step one. 70% uh, stake in the in the trustee manager is just step one. Step two would be, um, you know, Sino Ocean actually exercising their option to acquire the shares from the, from the outgoing uh, chairman that will increase their stake from in, in Dustin from about 6% to 30%. Uh, to know more than 30%. Yeah, so then that, I think that would be an even more credible uh, show of support for, for Dustin. Yeah. So those are the two things. Um, first of all, of course, would be financing. Second of all, uh, another key milestone would be the exercising of the option. Yeah. So that's for Dustin. Uh, the second question I see here is about views on Maple Tree Logistics preferential rights issue at $1.84, uh, whether or not to subscribe. So um, after running our calculations, this uh, third, uh, the third price, which is the theoretical x right price, uh, is about $1.89. One dollar and, um, $1 and so actually in line with the, market, the current market price. Um, however, the placement price is $1.84. So that means that there's actually a 2.6% discount to the third price. Yeah, so for those uh, investors who are actually hoping to get a... Uh, you know, get more shares. Um, a better way to to access or buy buy more shares would be through this placement, which is at a discount to the current market price as well as the third price. Yeah. Okay, so that's about it for me. I pass the time back to the rest of my colleagues. Okay. Um. Uh, let me just answer. One more, uh, okay, okay. Uh, let, um, sorry, I'm just looking at the, at the question. Uh, Hi, Paul. Does the new saliva antigen rapid test that's so accurate as the PCR uh, accuracy of 97 able to detect different viral viral, including micro, affect the profit and uh, and target price? Um, it 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 really depends how you know when you use PC again I'm not, not trying to come sugarcoat the answer but if you look at um, PCR it is still ninety nine percent I know that two percent sounds like it doesn't mean much but if you do it over hundred thousand it can be quite a lot uh, that's number one uh, 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 again of course uh, saliva is going to be so much more easier but I don't it may not totally replace it. When you do international travel, because I don't know whether if other countries will accept this uh, saliva antigen. So that's the first one. And for our Q and M, uh, we've already put it. The, I think our valuation is sixty million, uh, which was the transacted price. So uh, the the contribution from the the, the contribution from from uh, in terms of our target price is I think only ten to fifteen percent. Of our total target price because we only took in uh, of our market cap probably 600 plus million. Uh, again, I should know this, but I'm just pulling off my head. It's the market cap that we are taking is only 60 million. So for our target price, it is only 30 million that of, of this business is in the target price. Uh, because just as a refresh, when the when this PCR business was sold to uh, to to housing Q and M. At 60 million, I just I revise all the target price to just take in 30 million. So so it doesn't really so we're not really taking in much earnings from uh from the acumen, which is the diagnosis, diagnostics part. Uh, so, so the 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 COVID-19 test. Yeah. So I, I know it's a very long answer, but but yeah, of the target price, again, probably 10-15 percent only comes from the acumen. Again, because we, I mean, we all know this, it probably might be peaking also. So that's why we don't really take into account large, uh, so much. We're just hoping that maybe if they can do some uh, ART test too, and not just do PCR, so that could also help the business. Yeah, yeah. I hope I hope that 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 helps.
Yeah, because we 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 in the past we took in eighteen times PE for the business, but when the whole thing went to transition, uh, when it come to endemic, we didn't think to, we kind of derated the whole, uh, the whole COVID nineteen test business. Uh, okay. The next question is: uh, Do you have an explanation why Stanford Land share price dropped close to thirty percent after announcing rights issue? Uh, my only uh, I was looking at the circular. Uh, I uh, I just share it since since we have time. Uh, okay, for just for arguments. So the the circular, uh, the share price was you know the first thing we when we look at at least for me uh for the rice issue is always the theoretical X rice price because this means that if uh if immediately once the rice issue is, is over the share price will drop from forty eight from forty one, so the selling was expected. Uh, but I think whoever sold it, because there's no trading in these shares, hardly any trading, and the volume shot to 3 million, uh, I think probably someone who didn't want to take or couldn't fund his rights issue probably triggered the selling and probably that, I don't know, maybe margin call was, I'm not, no idea, I'm just totally speculating here. Uh, that's what triggered it to drop 30%. To right now, the share price is back to almost 34, which is the rights issue price. So, uh, so that's why you don't see any more selling because it doesn't really matter because it's really back to rice issue price. Uh, because it's almost it's almost a one for one. Uh, it's nine shares for every ten. So when it shot lower to thirty seven cents, uh, to maybe forty one cents, that means the theoretical extra price, which is which is based on the the amount of cash you raise from thirty four cents plus the current market cap, it shot back down to thirty seven. Then you got this key on it keeps on uh. It keeps on snowballing downwards to for 34, which is the rice issue price, which only makes sense. So the, the person who has the shares now doesn't won't get diluted. Uh, he will he will just uh, keep the shares. I mean he will just keep the amount of shareholding because uh, yeah. I, I, I think that's what happened again. I uh, hope it wasn't that confusing. Yeah. Okay, um not sure uh, uh, I'm not sure if anyone else has any questions. Uh, if not, uh, Viren, do you want to help in anything else? Uh, I think there's a concurrent another webinar running, so I think we have to end it soon. So sorry, guys. Oh, okay. All right, then. So uh, thanks, everyone. So this will be our last uh, webinar for the year. Just want to, if you don't, uh, wish everyone a Merry Christmas and also have a good year ahead. Uh, 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 more importantly, a healthy and, of course, a very prosperous 2022 for everyone. So thank you, everyone, for, your, for all your questions and your time spent. To, uh, spending with us. So uh, take care, everybody. We'll see you next next year, uh, early next year. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye bye.